thank you for everyone for joining us today. Um, as you are probably aware, I have also written a report on the value of solar, so if there are things that I missed in some of the details, that's a good reference. I'll mention again at the end of the presentation, but if there are kind of deeper dives that you're interested in taking, that's where a lot of that information is. It's freely available on our website. Um, so diving in, the value of solar. I wanted to start with talking a little bit about the concept, and the concept is really very simple. It's this notion that we should find a way to set a transparent and market-based price for solar energy. And that until, t uh, until now, until the policy that Minnesota has adopted, we really haven't had such a thing. And, and there are lots of implications for the way that we can de develop distributed solar energy um, if we have this kind of price. So uh, there are four pieces to this concept then. One is that in, in order to have this transparent and full cost accounting is that we are no longer producing energy from dirty sources when we're using energy from solar. So there's the environmental offset that is associated with the value of solar uh, as its first component. There is the avoidance of building other new power plants from any kind of resource, whether that's coal or gas or nuclear, any other kind of new power plant capacity the capacity that's brought online with a solar project helps to reduce the need for that new capacity. That's the second component in that value. The third component is this avoidance of the volatility of fuel prices. Um, you know, we know what the fuel price for solar will be for the entirety of the life of that solar panel. It's going to be zero. And that known quantity over a long period of time has a, a significant value to a utility and particular to its customers who are used to having to pay for fuel on a fluctuating basis. And finally, uh, the, the value of solar is meant to incorporate the avoidance of some wear and tear that we see on the utility grid system. I apologize for the picture, by the way. It's the best one I could come up to, with to represent this. But, th but the basic notion is that um, a lot of the, uh, the wear and tear on the utility system at substations, on distribution lines, on transmission lines has to do with the long distance sending of power and congestion that ensues during times of peak use. And solar, by being close to where we use energy, avoids some of the, that congestion. And that when these, uh, the equipment on the utility system operates then at less than full capacity, it is able to last for a longer period of time. So those are the four components, the environmental, the capacity, um, uh, the avoidance of, uh, of line losses and, uh, and reducing wear and tear on the system uh, that are part of this basic concept. And so now there's another interactive opportunity here in the chat window uh, the, in the lower left there. If you want to go ahead and put in a guess as to what this value of solar could be, uh, in particularly in Minnesota. I'm, I know there are a few of my Minnesota colleagues who are on this webinar who maybe can avoid giving away the answer, but I'm curious what people think about when they think about what the value of solar is in a price per kilowatt hour. You can go ahead and type in your answers in the chat box there. So we've got a pretty good range here, but kind of all in, the, in, in a similar area, you know, between 14 cents and about 20 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, which, is, which is definitely in keeping with a lot of the research um, that has been done on the value of solar. There's some excellent reports from a group called Clean Power Research um, that they've put together and, and sometimes go even higher when they include kind of more of the social costs. But um, in Minnesota, what we came up with, what, is, what has been reported by the uh, largest utility in the state, Excel Energy, and some preliminary filings at the Public Utilities Commission, is about 14.5 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, so those of you who put that number in uh, are obviously well read on what's going on in Minnesota or very lucky guessers. Um, but, it, but, but what I think is, is noteworthy is that you know, most of our responses were in the same range there, uh, between 14 and 20 cents a kilowatt hour. Like I said, Clean Power Research has done some excellent homework on all of these different components, uh, including some other ones in terms of economic benefits and uh, disaster resilience that can boost that number even higher. Um, I recommend their reports if you're kind of looking at more of the theoretical approach. Um, but in Minnesota, we came out with about 14.5 cents when you add up all of these components. Um, if you want a deeper dive, you can look at the actual statute as linked to um, and, and summarized in the report that I've written for what those value components were according to the law and then how the Department of Commerce in Minnesota then came up with the methodology. 
So 14.5 cents is pretty good, and I think the most notable thing to say about it in the Minnesota context is that's higher than a retail energy price. A retail residential customer in Minnesota pays about 12 cents a kilowatt hour. So the value of solar, if ultimately adopted, um, Excel has not actually filed to do value of solar yet, would, would be higher than the current retail energy price. So what I want to spend, now that we have this concept down, you know, this value-based transparent price, and we have a sense of kind of what's included in it and, and what that number might mean, I wanted to spend a little bit of time comparing to net metering, because this is for 30, now maybe even 40 years, been sort of the default policy that we have used to help uh, usher in the development of distributed solar energy. Um, and value of solar, at least as it's adopted, was adopted in Minnesota, re represents at least a modest shift. Um, as, and I will also cover a little bit about how that, the policy that we adopted differs from what was actually proposed and how that was even a bigger shift um, from what net metering has offered. So there are five uh, areas of comparison. And again, I, I just want to highlight that this is as implemented in Minnesota. This is not value of solar in general. Um, there are different notions for how to do value of solar. And of course, net metering differs from state to state. So, the first thing, though, is that customer earns a bill credit. Um, and, and that is exactly the same as with net metering as it is with value of solar. There won't be any checks cut independent of the electricity bill. It's all going to be accounted for within the electric bill. The second one is the credit value. And this is where one of the key differences is. Um, under net metering, the credit value is the retail electricity rate. I mean, technically, the credit is simply a kilowatt hour. Every kilowatt hour I produce with my solar array comes off of the kilowatt hours I pay for on my bill. But ultimately, it's the retail electricity rate that we're talking about in Minnesota, about 12 cents a kilowatt hour. The credit value of the value of solar is this value of solar rate. The 14.5 cents that we've seen in some preliminary filings is probably in the ballpark of what it will ultimately be once it gets adopted. The third thing uh, that is different between net metering and value of solar, a third comparison, I should say, uh, is that under net metering, that credit value fluctuates with the retail price, and it fluctuates every year. So now fluctuate is sort of a generous term. Generally speaking, retail energy prices are headed upward at a fairly rapid rate. So the rate that you get paid for or compensated with under net metering uh, tends to be going up from year to year. Um, but there's no guarantee of what that rate is, and it will change every year. The way we implemented it in Minnesota, the value of solar, that 14.5 cents, should be, that be the price, will be locked in on a 25-year fixed price contract. So every single kilowatt hour that a customer uh, produces from their solar array will get the exact same price for 25 years. And we were pleased with that because it, the, the notion there being that we want to make these systems easy to finance. And when you go to a bank and you want to take out a loan, they want to know what your collateral is in terms of your revenue stream, your ability to repay that loan. And we thought a long-term fixed price contract is a key piece of that. Uh, the fourth comparison is, is really a similarity, both under net metering and under value of solar as adopted in Minnesota. Solar production cannot exceed 120% of annual on-site consumption. In other words, you've got to match your solar array to the load that you've got. The 120% allows for some year-to-year you know, -year fluctuation. But the, the ultimate notion is that we're essentially operating like net metering has and, and does in so many other states with the notion that production should be similar to consumption. And finally, uh, this notion of net generation. Uh, in Minnesota, we're in kind of a weird place because we just upgraded our net metering statute from 40 kilowatts to a megawatt. Uh, under the previous policy, which had been in place since 1981, projects up to 40 kilowatts were allowed under net metering, but you got paid at the retail rate for any excess generation. So you could build a project that would generate lots more energy than you used on an annual basis, and you still got compensated at the same rate for every kilowatt hour. Uh, one of the compromises in shifting up to a 1 megawatt limit is that for projects between 40 kilowatts and a megawatt, any excess generation on an annual basis is paid at the avoided cost rate. So a much stronger incentive to not overproduce. Uh, with value of solar, we actually have a bit of a question mark. The statute um, seemed to indicate that if there was excess generation, it would be forfeit to the utility for no compensation which is not only in complete violation of the notion of the value of solar, which is that every kilowatt hour has a particular value, which we've calculated, and which is true to its actual value to the utility and, and rate payers, um, but is also just 
uh, uh, downright um, un-American, this notion that people would just give up their excess generation. Um, there's a bit of a question mark there in some of the other proceedings that have taken place around community solar and around value of solar. The Public Utilities Commission has uh, indicated that may not in fact be the way um, that excess generation will be treated. But there's a bit of a question mark right now as to how that's implemented. I can certainly say that from my perspective and from the perspective of folks who have been working on this policy in Minnesota, this is not what we set out to do. Um, we would be much more comfortable with, um, well, frankly, we, we, uh, subject to the limit I previously mentioned about being related to on-site consumption, constrained by the amount that you consume, uh, we think it would be reasonable that excess generation be paid at the value of solar. After all, that is what the solar electricity is worth. So, so given that comparison and that metering, I wanted to take at least a couple of minutes and talk about what we got for value of solar in Minnesota compared to what might have been, uh, and, and explain a little bit about what we started out asking for. Because I, what I would hate to have happen is that Minnesota sets this precedent about what value of solar means for the rest of the country, and folks that are interested in this policy thereby think, well, this is the best way to do it. We should do it just like Minnesota did. Um, maybe that's a little bit uh, naive or egotistical or both, but um, I think it's worth taking a little bit of walk down history lane uh, into late 2012 and early 2013 before this um, policy was adopted in Minnesota. So. Uh, the first thing is this notion of the bill credit. Um, the way I like to describe it is that value of solar essentially got wrapped within the net metering bubble in Minnesota. And, and so bill credits and, and the relationship between on-site production and consumption were all part of that. What we proposed was really more of a pure play, if you're familiar with the term feed-in tariff, that folks would get paid for all of the energy they produce in a separate transaction from their electricity bill in which they would pay uh, the utility for all the energy that they consume. And there are a whole bunch of reasons for why this took place, uh, some of which include issues around kind of tax liability and, you know, having to, uh, you know, pay taxes on the income you earn from solar, among other things. Um, but, that, uh, but that element was lost. Uh, and that, of course, then ties into the next piece here about the relationship between production and consumption. With a feed-in tariff, there is no relationship. The notion is that if I've got a rooftop that's suitable for solar, I put up as much solar as I think would be economical to do based on what I can get compensated. So that with value of solar, go ahead and fill a, a large warehouse rooftop with solar energy. The utility will pay exactly what it's worth, this value of solar price, and you still pay for the energy use at that warehouse facility, even if it's much, much less uh, than, it, than what you produce from solar energy. Um, the third thing is this question about net excess generation. Um, again, it's a big question mark about where we are right now in Minnesota, but the notion was essentially that whoever produces the solar energy gets paid for every kilowatt hour and gets paid the value of solar. Uh, it's sort of the whole notion behind value of solar uh, and coming up with that price. Uh, the fourth thing is about who gets to choose about value of solar versus net metering. Uh, we actually set out to offer customers a choice, that utilities would have to offer this as a program, as an option in addition to net metering, and then customers could make a choice. Do we like net metering better? Do we like value of solar better? Um, and, and we thought that was also help, that was helpful for a number of reasons. One was, this is somewhat of a new policy. Why not uh, give, give the utility an opportunity to test it out based on the people that opt for value of solar? Uh, and the second one, of course, was that it, it sort of gives you that comfort of knowing that if the value of solar somehow turns out really bad, we still have net metering. Ultimately, the way the policy was written, when the utility files to offer value of solar, it will replace for solar customers net metering for new solar customers. Existing customers will be grandfathered in under the previous net metering, net metering statute. Um, and then finally, uh, we when we set out uh, with this to develop this policy, the notion was that the solar customer retains the solar renewable energy credit um, and, and the way that it was adopted and, and seems to be going through the Public Utility Commission regulatory process is that the utility will automatically get the solar renewable energy credit along with the value of solar payment, uh, but there will be zero additional compensation. In other words, uh, the Public Utilities Commission seems comfortable with the notion that the value of solar payment uh, does in fact include all the value that would be uh, a, a, um, normally captured with a solar renewable energy credit. Uh, there's some disagreement about that, um, frankly, and about whether or not there is a, a sort of a compliance value to the solar rec um, that is not captured in the value of solar in terms of all of those components I mentioned earlier about avoiding pollution and whatnot. 
Um, but but it, we seem to be headed down the road where the utility will, uh, on that value of solar contract, uh, be, be capturing the solar rec for the 25 years. Um, the last thing I wanted to sort of explain, and this is sort of back to that notion of the feed-in tariff, is the way that we had envisioned it was we have a feed-in tariff that's essentially a two-part payment. Uh, one is this value of solar, which is the green bars, which is you know, fixed over the, the long period of time. And the second one would be a production-based incentive. You know, we, we knew going into this that whatever the value of solar was, it may not be quite enough to make projects financeable at this very small scale, like residential solar. We still wanted to have a residential solar market, and so we thought a production-based incentive financed from uh, maybe a systems benefits charge would be the way to do that. We do have some small-scale incentives in Minnesota, or, or incentives for small-scale projects, uh, a, a rebate program uh, for Made in Minnesota panels, and another smaller program uh, for, uh, for residential solar projects, but it's not the size of the pool that we had anticipated, nor is it actually signed as part of the same contract with the value of solar. So um, that was one other thing that was left behind in the legislative process, which as um, uh, Otto von Bismarck said, uh, is that if for folks who like either sausage making or, or uh, the making of laws, uh, one, should not, one should not be present at the making of the process. So, um, the, and the last thing I want to do is just highlight again that you know, you know, Minnesota is going to allow utilities to replace net metering with value of solar, and it could have been an option. I think that's very important to note that the way that we ended up doing it in Minnesota doesn't have to be the way that this policy comes about in other states. So now that we've kind of covered the, the concept, some preliminary notion of the prices, and this, uh, and this comparison to net metering, um, I'd like to address a little bit about how it might work for the different parties involved, in, including solar producers and customers and, and the utilities. Because um, ultimately, that's, the proof is in the pudding here. Did, we've created a policy that in, in its concept seems very strong, but um, we wanted to crunch some numbers and see about how it might play out. So the question for solar producers, obviously, is, is the value of solar enough? You know, there are, like I said, there are some, some incentives available for very small-scale projects in Minnesota. And so what this chart does, you've got three bars. The one on the left is that preliminary value of solar, the 14.5 cents, and the yellow line kind of carries that across. And then we have residential solar, which I just threw in $4 a watt for an approximate number. It may be a little higher or a little lower, depending on where you are. And commercial scale solar at about 3 bucks a watt. And, and the way to think of that is that you know, the value of solar will apply to projects a megawatt and smaller. Residential is obviously the small end, and the commercial projects are kind of the larger scale there. And if you look at the cost um, with the 30% investment tax credit, which would be the green bars for residential and commercial, you can see that value of solar might actually be enough for a commercial scale project based on the levelized cost over 25 years of producing energy from that uh, facility. Uh, for residential solar, it's not going to be enough, and that some other kind of incentive will be needed, whether that's the rebates um, that I mentioned previously that are available for small scale projects or some other yet to be named incentive. Um, so for solar producers, we think we've come up with a really good thing for kind of that mid, that mid size distributed market, uh, closer to a megawatt in size, you know, the rooftop of an IKEA store, for example. Uh, but for the really small scale stuff, like a neighborhood hardware store uh, or, or, a, or a large home, um, the value of solar by itself is not, it's not an incentive to drive the market. It is the value of solar, and it's probably not enough to make it easy to finance that, that project. Um, so will it work for customers? I thought it would be useful, you know, I, I've given you kind of a theoretical comparison between the net metering statute in Minnesota and value of solar. Uh, I wanted to give you kind of, you know, a typical customer's bill. So here's Jane and John Doe in Golden Valley, Minnesota. They've got a 5 kilowatt solar array and, and monthly energy use of about 2,000 kilowatt hours a month, which um, just as a caveat, uh, when I created this example, there was a reason I picked a number that high, um, but I know that's quite a bit higher than your average electricity consumption. But this is just for the purposes of illustration. So uh, based on uh, a cost per kilowatt hour, about 11.5 cents per month, or per kilowatt hour, um, uh, and the 2,000 kilowatt hours a month, their total electricity consumption is about $230. Um, when you look at the solar production then, a 5 kilowatt array, and the amount that it produces a month at the value of solar rate to your value of solar compensation would, would take about $79 off the bill. And so your net electricity bill then is about $151 with value of solar. So this is, this is the 2014 comparison, assuming the value of solar was adopted today. And we can compare that then to net metering here on the right. 
So we've got the same monthly usage and monthly solar production. We're netting kilowatt hours instead of, uh, instead of dollars, and so our net usage is 1458. And then multiply that by the cost per kilowatt hour from the utility, and the net electricity bill is 168 bucks. And ultimately what, what this is meant to show is that in the short run, in the near term, the value of solar means that somebody who has solar on their home rooftop is likely to come out a little bit better than under the existing net metering statute. Um, so that's a good thing. Uh, I want to take a quick moment to talk about community power. We have a, what's called a community solar gardens program, um, uh, so named because it was similar to the name being used in Colorado and a, a name I think that's been, I think, uh, that it's sort of a useful way to understand this concept. And, and so I'm, I'm going to jump back to that chart that I used uh, initially about solar producers. I'm, I'm kind of cutting out the middle one here because I think the commercial uh, project um, is a little bit better representation of what you might find for community solar projects. Um, they can be in that same size range uh, as other uh, projects under value of solar up to a megawatt. Um, and what you can see is that, well, with the value of solar, when a, in a typical commercial project, yes, that might be enough without any additional incentive. Um, the issue that we have with community solar, though, is that there's going to be some overhead associated with managing a community solar project. Uh, there's uh, there's going to be some due diligence that they have to do with the state attorney general's office um, in terms of you know, contextualizing how this might be some kind of investment for the people who are participating um, or how the bill credits are going to work out. Essentially just doing all of the disclosure process and whatnot, managing the lease with the property owner to build the solar array. And these things add cost to a commercial solar project that a project that is owned by the property owner uh, may not encounter. And so uh, what, we're, what we're finding through the proceeding in Minnesota is that the value of solar works out really well for an individually owned project. We're not so sure that it's going to work for uh, community solar gardens, especially ones that are on the smaller end of, of the range of, of the size range, you know, like a 40 kilowatt project on a school or on a church. Uh, may struggle to make it work with the value of solar, and there really aren't incentives available at that size scale for those projects. And so part of what the Public Utilities Commission is going to be re uh, wrestling with in the final uh, discussions is to decide whether or not value of solar will simply be the price, and that will then bias us toward larger community solar projects, or whether or not we'll see some kind of incentive. Um, and of course, then the last issue with community solar, though, is this notion of RECs. Um, I, I don't want to go too far down this road, um, but it, one of the things that's interesting is that Excel had, uh, filed initially uh, to say, we're not going to want to offer uh, community solar with the value of solar rate. We haven't filed for value of solar yet, so we want to just use the retail rate, like net metering. And the Public Utilities Commission said, well, we recognize that's probably not enough, 12 cents, to make these projects financeable. The statute, the legislature was very clear that they want these projects to work. The program has to actually result in community solar projects. So they tacked on a rec payment. And um, so we, we know that the Public Utilities Commission is on board with this notion of making community solar work. And it may be that they come up with some sort of rec payment or some other um, incentive that will help make these projects financeable at all sizes. So the last thing I want to address about will, will value of solar work is look at this notion of will it work for utilities? Because in particular, we've got utilities all over the country um, kind of pushing back against net metering and against distributed solar, and value of solar uh, may be able to offer up something here. And so when we look at the annual bill credit that a customer will get under value of solar and under net metering, uh, in green, you get kind of the 2014 comparison. This is the one that I showed you before from the customer's perspective. Um, and now I'm showing it from the utility perspective. And what we show is, well, it's going to cost utilities a little bit more to pay for those solar electrons under value of solar than under net metering. But if we fast forward about five years, based on the pace of rate increases over the past five years, and at least in Minnesota, Excel Energy, who is the, probably going to be the first utility to file for value of solar, um, has already promised several rate increases uh, along those lines. In five years from now, the, the difference between the two will actually be uh, very insignificant. We're talking about $10 a year, and, in the, and beyond that, uh, net metering will actually probably be higher than the value of solar. And so I think in the long term, this is a, a, a payment uh, or, or a, uh, a policy mechanism that actually turns out better for utilities um, than, it do, than 
uh, uh, than net metering. Now that being said, I, I, I want to kind of step back and look at this from the bigger picture of the future of solar. Um, so in the past, what we've had is a situation where we've got three lines on this chart. We've got the cost of solar in the orange. We've got the retail uh, energy rate in blue. And then we have this value of solar using the Minnesota number in green. And in the past, you know, 10 years ago, the cost of solar was much higher than the other two, and uh, including the retail energy price. And what that basically meant was that, number one, you needed subsidies to make solar economical because the net metering rate was too low, and, and, but that solar customers provided more value to the grid than they got paid for. Unless the utility was offering a rebate or something like that at the local level, uh, what, you, what the ratepayers are paying via net metering was actually less than the value of solar. So in a way, everybody was winning. Uh, taxpayers are, are providing subsidies for solar based on its environmental value and this expectation of falling prices. Utility customers are paying less than solar is worth, and solar customers are actually you know, making it pencil out for a payback. And in the present, and present should be in quotes, we've got a time because it, it may be now in some places and it may be about five years from now in other places around the country, but the cost of solar, the value of solar, and retail energy price are all kind of similar. They're all in the ballpark. And what that means is that minimal subsidies are needed to make solar work um, because the value of solar payment may actually be higher than the cost of solar depending on where you are and the retail energy price might actually be a good proxy for it, and so everybody is, is sort of made whole. But the future is kind of this big question mark. What you have going on in the future, and I alluded to this in talking about how the utility is going to make out five years from now with value of solar versus net metering, is that that retail energy price is going to be higher than the value of solar at some point, because retail prices in general continue to rise uh, year after year, and they've been accelerating in that, at that pace. So they're higher than the value of solar, which is itself higher than the cost of solar, which keeps falling. And, and what you have then happening here is that the value of solar by itself is sufficient to compensate solar producers without any kind of incentive or tax credit or subsidy, because now the cost of solar has fallen so low that paying what solar is worth as calculated you know, in, in a transparent and rigorous process is going to be enough. And the retail rate uh, are using that metering is, is payment in excess of that value, and in fact, it might be excessive. Um, and so what I think what we need to be cognizant of in the future is that we may be looking at a time with value of solar where uh, it, it is less lucrative than net metering for solar customers, but not, really, it, but not to say that it's not lucrative. Folks will still be able to make out fairly well by producing energy from solar, but, we may have a it, but if we don't change policy, whether that's value of solar or some other kind of policy, we may actually have sort of a political problem on our hands where we're paying with under net metering a price that's much, much higher than it, it, it actually costs to generate power from solar. And, and one has to ask the question, is that exactly how we want to spend that money? Is there a more efficient way that we could spend that in our electricity system, whether it's buying more renewables or driving down energy consumption or what have you? Um, and I think that means what that, the implication for that, of course, is all of these states, uh, some 20 states, are having some kind of debate uh, over this value of solar energy, whether that's a fight about net metering or fees that are being added onto solar customers or uh, a, you know, having a value of solar docket at the Public Utilities Commission. This discussion is happening all over the place. And I think the important thing to note about what Minnesota's value of solar policy means is, is it, it's not saying this is the great policy that should be adopted in every one of these states. What we're saying out of Minnesota is we've come up with a really great transparent and rigorous way of, of calculating the value of solar that should inform all of these conversations. And whether or not that means that folks want to adopt a value of solar policy, well, that's up to them and it's up to their state. But I think the value of solar uh, concept uh, provides a lot of power uh, to add into that conversation. And frankly, at this time, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's of advantage to solar advocates to, to look at this policy and, or, or, and to look at this calculation and to say, it's likely that utilities have not been paying as much as solar energy is worth, and this is a great opportunity. So with that, um, I think I would like to take your questions. Rebecca has already told me I've got five good questions, and um, I would like to uh, address some of them. I think, uh, Rebecca, I don't know if the process was you want me to read through them really quick or if you wanted to pick them out. 
Um, yeah, if you want to just read through them, and uh, a couple of people have been um, answering them in the chat, but uh, probably a little bit of follow-up would be uh, would be helpful for for those as perfect. well. So we now have seven to, questions too. By the I'll way, I'll try to focus on the technical questions first, but then um, I'll get back to some of these other questions as well. So the first one uh, from Richard about value of solar being a buy all sell all. Uh, I would put that in quotes. Like that is the general. It's the general intent of the program is that you, you buy all your energy from the utility, you sell all your solar production to the utility at this value of solar. That, what, what that comes back to is that big question mark I said about net excess generation. Um, is, so right now it's sort of buy all, sell all, sort of, in the sense that the way that we adopted in Minnesota and wrapping it into that net metering envelope is as long as you're not producing more than you use on site, yes, you will buy all your energy and sell all your energy. Um, but, but, uh, but, the way, but if you were to put on a solar array on, for example, an empty warehouse, uh, no, it would not be buy all, sell all because of the way that we've structured the program, it has to operate more like net metering. Um, second question about locking in the value of solar and especially in the context of rising fossil fuel prices. Um, well, what, what is going to happen is that the value of solar figure, the formula will be recalculated every year, um, but the people who are signing contracts, for example, in 2014 lock in that price for 25 years. And the thought there is that that certainty of price over that long-term contract for an individual solar producer is going to be worth more in terms of dropping the cost of financing for solar than would be the, you know, the hope that fossil fuel prices rise over time. You know, who knows if 10 years from now there's another kind of fracking that comes up and makes fossil fuel prices like for natural gas very cheap. Well, if, if the price were allowed to fluctuate year to year for everybody, um, then, then folks are subject to that risk. So that was the notion behind this is that the long-term contract gives you certainty, certainty lowers risk, and lowered risk means lower financing costs. Um, but, but that being said, the value of solar does get recalculated every year. So the person who signs a contract in 2015 will have a different price than the person who signed in 2014 same goes for every subsequent year. And so the, it will adjust if fossil fuel prices do rise over time, the, the value of those long-term contracts will then rise as well. Um, so the idea is that we get an adjustment year to year in the market, but that we give certainty to people who have already signed up. Um, question about value of solar being figured for annual production or monthly. Um, I, I don't know quite how to answer that one. The, the value of solar is going to be a sort of universal price for every kilowatt hour from a solar array. And so the way that it works on the bill is that a customer will be compensated on, on every monthly bill. So on every month, they will get paid for the value of the solar electricity they produced. I assume that if they were producing more than they consume, uh, or I know that if they produce more than they consume, there's sort of an annual true up. So they can carry it over for up to 12 months. Uh, and then I think it's like every February or something, there's a true up period. And it's that part that is still the question mark about what happens when you true up if you have excess generation. Um, question about electric rates in Minnesota. Um, we pretty much have flat rates for most customers. I think there are a few, um, uh, you know, it's, it's different for each customer class, but we don't have declining block or inverted rates. Um, it's pretty much flat per kilowatt hours. And then you know, for commercial industrial customers, there are demand charges. Um, so at what, <laughs> Joy, Joy's question about what point do you start to get grid defection? Well, we're getting it already. Everybody who's going uh, solar to some extent is defecting in a manner of speaking. Um, I think you're referring probably to this notion of are folks going to completely go off grid? And I think, I think the, the economics around that are much more hazy. And I think, what I think what's important to understand about value of solar that's different from net metering is that net metering, it's an accounting policy, but the principle behind it is sort of this notion of I'm generating for myself. Now, we all know that's not really where the electrons go. And in fact, that's the whole notion behind net metering is that I'm probably not home at noon on Tuesday if I'm a working person and I'm not going to use those kilowatt hours. So net metering lets me get them anyway, even though I know that it's kind of going to my neighbors and, and whatever because there's sort of this recognition, well, that solar is still valuable. Um, 
with that philosophy, though, you do sort of drive toward independence. And that's sort of the issue, especially as retail energy prices keep rising, it becomes very economical to try to produce as much of your own energy as you can. Um, the value of solar, I think, kind of buys into this notion that there are network benefits of all being grid interconnected and not going off the grid one by one and having batteries and that kind of thing. And it says, you know, we're going to calculate what this value of solar energy is to everybody, and everybody kind of pools together their solar energy by selling it all to the utility, and the utility provides its network as backup for everybody because it's probably cheaper to do it for everyone collectively than it is individually. So I, that, that is kind of an interesting philosophical thing, uh, difference, I think, between that metering and value of solar. And you see that a little bit in the argument that's taking place between some folks over this value of solar notion about how value of solar is somehow um, uh, you know, impinging on this right to self-generation because it's saying you have to sell your electrons to utility. And I guess you know, it, there, there is an element of that, although there, if you want to listen to a good discussion about that, um, I have a podcast with Carl Robigo from the formerly from the Austin Energy, where he talks about sort of that notion of the right of self-generation and, and why he disagrees with it. Um, so let's see, some other good questions. Um, from a consumer standpoint, why would I want value of solar? Um, certainty, uh, the, the certainty of the long-term contract, the fact that at least in the short term the rate is higher than the net metering rate. Um, uh, ultimately, I think, because we I think most people want to see more solar on the system. And if, you know, let's just take it to extremes. In Germany, the retail energy price is 30 cents a kilowatt hour. The feed-in tariff price for small-scale uh, renewable uh, solar is like 13 cents. So 13 cents is sufficient to get people to install solar and to give them a reasonable return. If we had net metering in Germany, if they used net metering, we'd pay 30 cents. Now that's 17 cents a kilowatt hour we could be using for some other socially useful purpose. It could be you know, grid storage or vehicle-to-grid stuff or electric vehicles or what else. Um, and so the question is kind of, do we want to pay that much extra, if you will, in the long run, 10 years from now, when retail energy prices are a lot more than the value of solar? I would argue that it would be more important to have uh, a policy that is kind of economically efficient, that encourages people to install solar, but doesn't over-reward them for doing that and, and preserves resources on the, on the system to be used for those network benefits like storage for everybody or you know, a system that's there when your solar array goes down or, or what have you, or when the sun isn't shining as utilities like to mention so often. So I, I think that's that you know, from the consumer perspective, from the pure play like just looking at the pocketbook, yes, if I have a solar array on my house, I will do better under net metering in the long run. But when we talk about it collectively, um, I don't have a great metaphor for this, but I'm sure I'll come up with it eventually. I, th I think that we, it, it's more responsible to look at a different way of doing compensation. Um, some other great questions here. Thank you, everybody, for the questions. I really appreciate it. Uh, Doug's question about, will the value of solar rates change as more PV is added to the system? There is, a, there is like a, a placeholder for that in the value of solar formula. I don't think any of us anticipate that until we have like 10%, 15%, 20% solar, that there will be any kind of sort of negative implication in terms of grid integration costs, but it's there uh, for future discussion. Um, so yes, it can happen. The question, of course, is will the, imp the, the sort of negative impact of grid integration costs ever outweigh, for example, the savings from fossil fuel avoidance or avoiding carbon emissions or those kind of things? Um, uh, good questions about the comparison to value of solar and the German feed-in tariff. Um, uh, you know, I agree about the feed-in tariff. I mean, the, it being a very powerful policy to lead to local ownership and the attendant economic benefits, and of course, all of the political support for renewables in Germany. Um, I, 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 I think I think there are some people who sort of demagogue against the feed-in tariff because they have a problem with feed-in tariffs. Um, you know, we can debate that policy on its merits. In some places that has worked really well, like Germany, and other places it didn't work so well. And policy wonks can spend a lot of time getting into the weeds on that. But I guess what I would say is the value of solar as adopted in Minnesota is a lot more like net metering than it is like a feed-in tariff. Um, I think it can still work well, that being said, um, in the long run. But I think it's... Um, uh, I, 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 don't, I think that kind of devolution into an argument about feed-in tariff is really not very useful. Um, 
Bill's got a question about how the 14 and a half cents was arrived at. Um, I don't know that I can get too much more into detail about the value components. Um, there's more in my report on it, and it gets kind of technical, or it gets technical fairly quickly um, about the way that they put together the formula. For example, like the, just to give you an example, the avoided cost on natural gas is, um, is based on uh, you know, looking at natural gas futures prices, then a constant escalator from there on out after the futures markets no longer offer pricing. I think it's after 10 or 15 years. And then you sort of take the net present value of what that is over time at a certain discount rate and then plug that in as, a, as one of the components of the value of solar. And I, you know, I can't remember exactly, but somewhere in the ballpark of like four cents a kilowatt hour. So it's that kind of ca calculation that for each of those components um, you know, I summarized them into about four, but I think there were eight uh, all told that they used. And uh, I'm going to have to refer you in the report. I also link to the Department of Commerce and some of the PUC documents where you can read chapter and verse on, like, literally, here's the spreadsheet for how they did the calculation. Um, it's probably too much to cover uh, in a webinar presentation. Um, Terry's got a good question here about regarding community solar and what, it, what do we recommend as policy to allow smaller projects to succeed, um, a, you know, a small production incentive, two or three cents a kilowatt hour like the PUC was willing to tack on to this, um, you know, Excel's proposed retail rate um, might be all that it takes. Um, I, think, I think the important part is to understand that it's a socially useful thing. You know, three quarters of Americans don't have a suitable sunny roof that they own for solar. The only way they're going to get in this game is through community solar or virtual net metering or some other kind of policy. And, and arguably, there are lots of economic benefits to allowing those people to put their energy dollars in their community instead of sending them out for imported coal and gas, as does happen in most states. So um, I, it would have to be a production incentive, and it would have to be based on the size of the project. I think the way that the PUC split up their, their proposed REC payment which may or may not be adopted for value of solar, it's, I'm kind of going off into the weeds here, was like three cents a kilowatt hour up to 250 kilowatts per project, and then the 250 to uh, kilowatt to one megawatt projects would get two cents. Uh, that's, that is a, that's a good way, I think, to design that policy. Um, Chad had a question about the time frame for finalizing the value of solar. Um, what's happened right now is Excel filed a motion to reconsider uh, the policy, which may be a precursor to a lawsuit. The Public Utilities Commission took that motion to reconsider and pretty much flushed it down the toilet um, and so, and has affirmed that you know, the law was followed, the process was followed appropriately. If you're going to adopt this thing, stop complaining about it. Um, I believe they have about somewhere in the ballpark of like 30 days to do something next. So that may either mean that before like the second week of June we will see a, a filing to offer value of solar from Excel Energy, or we may see some other legal step taken to avoid filing that. Um, so I can't really answer that question fully. I just know that in the next two to three weeks we're going to find out one way or another which road we're going down. Um, Eric has a question about how in the world did, did people get Minnesota to adopt this? Um, a lot of organizing, uh, remarkable organizing by folks in what was called the Solar Works for Minnesota Coalition. It, it's a, it was a coalition of over 140 organizations, uh, business, um, solar businesses, uh, other business, small businesses, indus solar industry, environmental advocacy groups. They had been plugging away since like 2009 or 2010 at the legislature around solar working on an executive order, uh, solar for public buildings, studies of solar capacity. And then we just got to, you know, uh, you know, full disclosure, in the fall of 2012, prior to the election, everybody was talking about, well, what are our options really going to be at this legislative session? And then the Democrats swept the legislature and we had a Democratic governor. So all of a sudden, all of that organizing and, and work that had gone in in the pri previous years led to this huge open policy window, and we were able to jump in uh, and, and get policy passed. So that was, and it was the entree to a whole bunch of things. It wasn't just value of solar. It was we got a solar energy standard for investor-owned utilities. We got community solar. We got value of solar. Um, but it really was the politics that led to all of that. Um, let's see here. Bill wants me to speculate on how this value method could work for geothermal. Um, I think a value of, you, you could do value of energy for anything, fill in the blank. Um, I, I think the problem is that um, 
solar is very module, uh, modularized. It's very simple in some, uh, well, let me take that back. The costs of solar are very well understood, and it's a very module, si modulized system, so you kind of know the cost in general for about the scale, same scale of the project. Um, I know that's a little different than that question. I guess I would say, yes, you could do this for anything. You just need to understand a little bit more about the, what the value components are. Solar has been on grids in a lot of different places. We kind of understand how it works, when it produces, and why that energy is worth something. Um, in theory, you could do the same with geothermal or anything else, um, but it just hasn't been studied as well. And we were able to borrow on some great work that had been done in Austin, Texas, uh, to get stuff started in Minnesota. Um, Rebecca has a question about the role of microgrids in the playing in the value of solar. Um, you know, in some ways it does, in some ways it doesn't. Um, you know, there are sort of two ways to structure a microgrid. There's the sort of notion of doing it behind the meter or internal to itself. And in that case, you know, if a microgrid has storage and can island itself from the grid, then it can really use all that solar itself. And then, then it really can still get that retail energy price, if you will. So, you know, let's say in 2020 you have a microgrid on a college campus. The retail energy price is 20 cents. The value of solar is 14 cents. Well, if you can use a battery storage that you've got available on your local grid, then you can offset 20 cents a kilowatt hour in energy purchases from the grid um, instead of selling it to the utility at 14 cents. So I think microgrids will give people the, the opportunity to play for whatever is the most economical. Um, uh, but, that, but, I, but I don't know that it's, um, but that I, don't, that I would go any further than that. Um, okay, good question about net metering rate of like 30 cents a kilowatt hour would enable the faster adoption of solar. Um, yes, it would, um, and, and I think, uh, and, and I think there, you could make that argument. I think what I would say is that that argument actually is a lot like the German feed-in tariff notion but the notion there was we'll pay what the actual cost of solar is to drive market adoption plus a nice little reasonable return on investment. That will drive people to do solar and drive the cost down. I think if you pay $0.30 cents a kilowatt hour for people doing solar you know, five years from now, um, we're paying them a ridiculous amount. I mean, we could pay people to do anything when they've got a 150% profit margin, uh, and they'll buy anything to drive down the cost. Um, I, the question is whether or not we're going to get that many more people to do it at 150% profit margin than at a 15% profit margin. Um, so uh, good question. I'm actually writing an article I'm going to publish after this webinar about it on ILSR.org's website, so read more there if you are curious about kind of the that general argument about the future policy for solar. All right, I'm going to cut in here and just uh, let you know that it is 2.30 now. So um, if you want to take one final question, or uh, we can have people stick around if you have a couple of questions um, that you want to finish up with. Yeah, that sounds good, Rebecca. Um, I think I'll, we'll do one more question, and then I have a little bit of time, and I would actually uh, what I think I would be fun to do if it doesn't seem unmanageable is I'll take one more question, we'll wrap up. I'm sure a lot of people have other things they need to do, um, but then maybe we can, uh, if, if folks want to stick around, I can answer questions for 10 or 15 more minutes. Um, so one last question in our official time um, about the renewal of the investment tax credit um, and what happens if it falls back to 10%. Um, so the, in, the, in some of the uh, analysis that I've done going forward, I would say what happens is uh, not a whole lot, frankly. If, if we can continue to see declines in the cost of solar at a, at a modest pace, you know, not nearly as fast as we have over the past five years, uh, where it's been like 10% per year or more, but even more like 5 or 7%, um, it's going to be enough within a couple of years to overtake that lost benefit. Um, but I think the upside is actually a lot bigger. When we stop being hobbled to some extent by the necessity of the federal tax credit, all of a sudden the democratization of solar becomes that much easier. Because right now, when you want to do a solar project, especially like a community solar project or anything that aggregates people's investment, you need tax equity investors. You need some sort of large bank that can use a big fat tax credit. And, um, and that, that partner, if he wants to participate in your project, wants a big robust return on investment, like 15, 20, maybe even more percent. Um, I think that the solar market's really going to get good when we no longer have to rely on that tax credit, when we can do financing that is much simplified, that cuts out those equity investors, 
uh, and that focus is really simply on like the value of solar and the cost of solar electricity. Um, I've always felt like the, the tax credit actually presents a big problem because of the structure of it. Now, is that to say that in places like, you know, Portland, Oregon, where the sun isn't that great, that we shouldn't still have incentives for solar? You know, that, that is going to be an issue, in it, but I think it's going to be more of a regional or local issue than it's going to be a national one, whereas continuing with the tax credit, I think, continues to raise a lot of problems about access to financing and, and, and participation. So uh, I'll let Rebecca do a quick wrap-up, and then if folks want to stick around, I'm happy to answer a few more questions. All right. Thank you very much, John. Uh, yeah, wrapping up here, I just want to let everyone know that we did record this webinar, and um, I'll be sending that out to everyone who was registered. Uh, so you can uh, listen and share and, and all of that. Also, uh, when you do disconnect, you'll be asked for, uh, to give your feedback about the webinar, and we'd love to hear from you, good, bad, or otherwise, comments and questions. Uh, to help us sort of uh, make a better webinars for the future. So thank you again so much for uh, sticking around and listening to what we had to say. Um, and I think I will unmute. Um, we'll, try, we'll try unmuting people's lines for this next part. There's still quite a few people in here. So um, if we find that we're uh, talking over people too much, uh, then I'll probably mute again, and then we'll just go back to the chatting, so uh, just so that we're not too overwhelmed. Um, so uh, with that, I'm going to unmute your lines. Um, thank the you conference much, has been unmuted. So I'll, I'm going to keep looking at the questions that are in the chat window, but this will be an opportunity for folks who want to follow up on answers I already gave too to jump back in. So I'm going to answer one question here, and then I'll pause to give people a chance to jump in if they want to. Um, Fred had asked about why individuals should invest for the social value of solar rather than their own protection against rate, against rate increases, I think kind of alluding to how the value of solar pays out versus net metering. Um, you know, I think there, like I said before, there are kind of two issues at play here. One is, you know, if we're going to construct policy to uh, encourage the development of distributed solar energy, I think it is important to think about what is economically efficient. How are we spending ratepayer dollars or customer dollars or you know taxpayer dollars? And and so I do feel like whether or not you know yes, I think an individual person might look at the economics of solar and say net metering would work out a lot better. I think we do have to make a decision given that this is a public policy question about whether or not it's more responsible to. Um, allow people to do net metering when that rate is offers a significant profit margin versus um, versus paying something that still incentivizes solar but may not um, be as lucrative. Um, so I think individually it's it's a great point, but I think that the policy ends up being made. You know, it's a you know net metering is a state policy. It's made as a state law, and I think we have to look at it through that frame of what's good for all of the residents of the state of Minnesota or whichever state are adopting policies. I'm going to jump on another question here, um, since nobody jumped in right there, and look uh, about kind of this notion of combining the best of net metering and value of solar. Um, you know, to some extent, that's what we did in Minnesota. I, I like that question because of that. Um, you know, we said we're going to keep the sort of simplified notion uh, of having it all on your utility bill. We said that we're going to keep the same notion that production has to be tied to consumption. Um, we're going to, uh, um, you know, do it through a bill credit, and that we're going to true up at the end of every year. Um, you know, I, I guess I, in some ways I would say, like, what are the other elements of net metering that are so important to keep? Uh, you know, obviously net metering ha often has a lot to do with it's the same policy for everyone. You know, it's a standardized tariff. I, th I think that's definitely something that we want to keep in whatever policy that we adopt. Um, I think the value of solar calculation is really valuable, and, and I said and I said this before and I would say it again, uh, for all of those discussions around the country where this is happening, um, you know, Minnesota's value of solar provides actual evidence, an actual number that you can have a conversation around in all these debates about what solar is worth and about who's subsidizing who and whether or not there should be a fee tacked onto solar customers. Um, 
I remain pretty skeptical based on the outcome in Minnesota that any utility has a lot of justification to be charging solar customers extra for grid access. Um, that the value of solar really, um, it being higher than the retail rate and, and a fairly robust number suggests that it's been a pretty good deal to have solar producers on your grid. Um, you know, the, uh, and he basically said he's, and he's been in this industry for 30 years. He's never seen a utility do what he calls a cost of service study that differentiates between solar customers and customers without solar. Uh, what that is is essentially, you know, a very robust deep dive in from a utility's perspective of how much does it cost us to bring electricity to this customer. And, and what he's saying is no utility has actually looked at whether or not it costs anything different to serve a solar customer as a non-solar customer from, from that standpoint. So, uh, you know, and, and what he, I think, articulated and I would agree with is until we see a study like that, it's inappropriate to be uh, asking solar customers to pay more. I think value of solar, the concept and the number in Minnesota, whether or not people adopt the policy adds to that conversation. Well, uh, John, uh, in Duke Energy Carolinas, did, they didn't do a cost of service study, but they did try to approach this issue of additional solar going into the grid from distributed resources. And it had been anticipated that they were going to use that to attack net metering. But then the North Carolina Sustainable Energy Association kind of uh, pulled a fast one and um, filed something with the commission before they were able to present the study. So. Um, and certainly in Arizona, that is what the staff was recommending um, when uh, uh, Arizona Public Service was trying to change the net metering. They, they were proposing that APS do that kind of a cost of service study, which of course they didn't, but it certainly was called for. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Laura. Real quick, if you, uh, when you, Speak if you can just uh, say your name real quick or, or let us know who's speaking just so we can get an idea of who you are. That'd be great. Sure. That that was just Laura Arnold with Indiana DG. Ah, wonderful. Thanks. Um, for there's another question here in the chat about the risks for the utility in having a contract for 25 years at a certain mm -hmm. value. Um, yes, there's always a risk in signing a contract. Um, you know, there were utilities that got burned by signing long-term natural gas supply contracts you know, six years ago before fracking dro drove the price of natural gas down. Um, that being said, that, that's actually very typical for utilities to sign long-term purchase contracts. Um, that's how they procure wind power. That's how they buy power in general from independent power producers. A lot of their power comes on these long-term supply contracts. So, um, and, and I guess what I would say about it is knowing that we're, they're signing up at a price that actually reflects the value, uh, you know, it's, when, when, they, when they normally sign a power purchase agreement, it's based on a negotiated price that has to do with kind of what the utility thinks it can get from somebody else and, and not what the actual value of that resource is. And so they may negotiate a deal for a purchase of wind power, for example, that is a really great deal and has absolutely nothing to do with how much money that wind power producer will make. What we've got with the value of solar is a way of saying, we don't know what that person will make in terms of money, but we do know that the utility, when they sign that contract, is essentially, it's, the utility and its ratepayers are essentially held harmless. They're getting this energy, and we've done our best to calculate um, how much it's actually worth, and then that's what the utility is paying. And it offers 25 years of price certainty. And that's, in, in my mind, that price certainty is worth an awful lot more than the utility really has right now, because I see on my bill every month a fuel cost adjustment um, that fluctuates from month to month as the utility's cost of procuring coal and gas change or even uranium for their nuclear plant. Um, I, I think that's a really powerful upside for utility customers is no longer being subject to that risk. Okay. L Laura well, Arnold again, Indiana DG. John, have you ever thought about how this value of solar compares to the olden days 
pre-divestiture when we used to deal with value of service for telephone service? Have you ever explored that analogy? I have not explored that analogy. That's a good question. If you've got anything on it, though, I'm very curious. So please well, um, send me something. But that's, that's yeah, I, I, I hadn't thought about it until just this afternoon listening to you. So let, let me... Yeah, let me bounce it around. Cool. Well, I think it's probably a good time to wrap up. I haven't heard people clamoring to jump in to ask questions. Um, folks can certainly always follow up by email, and as Rebecca mentioned, we'll probably do a, a, another version of this um, webinar based on your feedback um, sometime in August. So John. thank you, everybody. I very much appreciate it. Oh, John? Yeah. John? I'm still John. here. Us. Yeah, John? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was wondering, I had, this is Terry Gibbs, I had asked um, just regarding community solar, just more of a local thing, how, how important do you feel Minnesota made uh, panels are, um, ver you know, though they're more expensive than Chinese panels, and, you know, is there a trade-off uh, in terms of Minnesota jobs, economic growth, and having a project that has a much lower cost and faster payback for the subscriber. I, I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about that. Yeah, well, I guess my what I think is really key in that conversation about Minnesota Made is that I think states and ratepayers and taxpayers should be able to use their own resources to provide incentives for local manufacturing because there's a very clear, you know, chain of value from that local manufacturing to the tax base to jobs to economic development such that it all circles around. Um, and so I think it is worth paying a premium to, to get local panels. Um, you know, I don't think that it's either desirable nor legal to require that all panels come from local manufacturers, but I do think that it's important that the state have the ability to do that. That being said, I, I think you know, I, we did some fairly interesting modeling about how you would design sort of the ideal incentive for Made in Minnesota products um, before the 2013 legislative session. Um, that conversation was completely out of our hands once we got there. Um, the folks who had sort of nurtured that incentive, which predated the value of solar and the solar energy standard and whatnot, were not really interested in kind of reopening the way that it was designed. So. What we did accomplish was it went from an upfront rebate to a production-based incentive um, in terms of design, which I think is crucially important because it, you know, then you're paying for performance and not paying simply for the installation of those panels. Um, but, I, but I do think that, um, yeah, I, I think it's important that we have that option. I think it's important to provide incentives that are reflective of the economic value. Um, and I think what, what that means is if writ large you may have some panels that are so costly that they may not pay back. You, you may not be able to offer an incentive high enough based on their economic value uh, to cover their actual cost. And in other cases, you might be able to. And so um, I, I, I'm not saying that about any particular manufacturer in Minnesota, uh, but simply that in, in the theory of it, um, you, know, it you, have to, you need to set your pricing uh, for your incentive appropriate to the economic impact. And um, and, and that you do then hope for the best that you can hope for. Right. I, I guess the, 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 you know, just the question that we're facing as we look at various community solar projects is uh, some are trying to use Minnesota-made panels, and it, you know, they're much more expensive, and the payback isn't as good. And, and I'm trying to decide from the standpoint of potential subscribers if that's a good thing that they're actually providing that local subsidy. Uh, or if from a jobs perspective, because some of those panels, the, the parts are really coming from China, they're just assembled here. So then is it really, it's called Minnesota Made, but it's not <laughs> really Minnesota Made. So I'm, I'm just trying to sort through that. And the other issue is this question about size, um, you know, where these guys mm -hmm. are, who are offering one megawatt uh, can, also significantly drop the, pr the, the price so, and get faster payback. So I'm just struggling with both those two issues and wondering if you have any guidance on 
how we should think about it at the Alliance for Sustainability, mm -hmm. talking to people. Um, you know, I, I think what I would say about it is that um, the, it's worth coming up with an incentive structure to pay for what is economically desirable. So right. there, there is an advantage in having Minnesota-made panels. I think there's also an advantage in making sure that you can have participation in projects that are both large and small. I mean, right. otherwise, why have the program open? And so I liked what the PUC did with their you know, REC proposal on the community solar gardens that split it up by the size of the project. I think that shows that they also understand that that's a you know, socially and economically desirable thing. Um, and I think it's important to have an incentive for Made in Minnesota. And I, and I think you know, there, there are two ways to look at it from a customer perspective. One is I'm willing to sacrifice some rate of return because I know inherently as a values thing, rather than value, but from value standpoint, a moral or ethical standpoint, I want to buy Minnesota Made. But then the other one would be from a value standpoint, do we provide enough incentives so that somebody can be essentially um, you know, economically uh, neutral to the notion of buying Minnesota Made or foreign made um, because we provide enough incentive to cover the difference. And so yeah. that, you know, there's a couple different ways about it. I don't know that, uh, I, I, and I think you know, there, either one can work, um, but you're of course going to get a better uptake if you're not asking people to sacrifice too much on their, on their return. Right. I mean, right now the sacrifice is it's double. Uh, and so that's what I'm trying to figure out is, is that, like, well, some people even, if you add in the large size of one megawatt project, I mean, you're, you're talking about, you know, is way more than double, you know. So I'm just, mm -hmm. a, a payback that, that some people claim could be three years versus 18 years if you do smaller projects and, um, use Minnesota made panels and that's rather stark different. Right. And right. You know if are are there plans to increase the Minnesota made amount at all or so that it would be more neutral or or, or not at the present time? Well, I you know Terry, I'm going to suggest we take this conversation offline to another time just cuz I'm running out of time myself. Okay, sure. But sure. I, I, I think those are great questions, um, and I, I don't know the answer to all of them, unfortunately. I'm not really plugged into sure. like, what the Minnesota made incentive, is, where it's going or whatnot, but uh, happy to follow up with you offline. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much. This was really valuable. I really think you did a great job, John. Thanks so much, and thank, everyone, thank you, everyone else. Um, thank you. Please feel free to offer up any comments or, or thoughts uh, for improving the presentation for the next time around, and uh, you know, happy to hear from you in other ways as well. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Have a good afternoon.